dear students. So, today in our class, we will try to understand uh, the cloud morphology, which means to be able to identify or categorize various different types of clouds depending on their shape, their color and their moisture content. Okay. So, this is, uh, this is going to be a lecture about cloud classification. We always see uh, at any given point of time, we see several different types or several diff different shapes of clouds. So, we would always want to know how this, uh, what is the physical mechanisms, what is the physical mechanism which will result in the formation of these different types of clouds and how to identify which type of cloud will give you precipitation and how to identify which process will lead to the formation of which particular type of cloud. And uh, after all this, we should be able to name or we should be able to identify a particular type of a cloud with a given name. So, we will try to understand or we will try to classify the clouds and we will try to understand the basic naming mechanism of the clouds. So, this class is going to be uh, about the cloud morphology. So, we will, we will briefly touch upon the mechanism of cloud formation. How do the clouds form? Like, uh, so, what is the mechanism? which will lead to the formation of clouds. We, we have seen that in, in the discussions of atmospheric stability or uh, in discussions of, about uh, humidity variables. We have always understood that whenever uh, the saturation is reached within an air parcel and if the temperature is further decreased, it will lead towards uh, the formation of a cloud or it will lead in the, in the form of condensation and the collection of this uh, tiny water droplets, very small water droplets is generally called as a cloud. We will try to see how many different types of clouds exist and how to, how do we name them, what is the name, nomenclature of these, these various different types of clouds. So, within this when you talk about classifying the clouds, there are, there are there is what is called as primary classification and there is also a classification which is, uh, which is based on the heights, uh, which is also known as the secondary classification. Finally, we will try to understand what is, what is the specific type of cloud, which is not exactly the interest in the interest of lower atmosphere, but in the interest of upper atmosphere, which are called as the noctilucent clouds. Then we will try, we'll also try to see uh, the formation of fog, which is near the surface of the earth, which also resembles a diffused cloud on the earth. Right. So, let us see how we can uh, achieve this goal of understanding uh, cloud classification in this particular lecture. Okay. So, just to review uh, the process of condensation, condensation is nothing uh, but when, when the temperature of the air parcel is decreased sufficiently that uh, the uh, existing moisture content becomes equal to the maximum amount of moisture content that can be held by the air parcel. Ultimately, when you cross this limit, the air parcel will condense. Now, two things happen. When it condenses, the tiny water droplets are formed on the uh, cloud condensation nuclei. Second thing that will happen is due to the condensation, a latent heat is released into the air parcel, into the system for example. And this latent heat is the reason why uh, the saturated air parcels uh, will cool more slowly when they rise vertically upwards. The idea of condensation is a very important concept in the fog and cloud formation, let us say, uh, in evaporation or in condensation, things like that. Right. Now, let us say if you see this uh, picture, what you see is uh, on the right is that the amount of water vapor that can be held within a given air parcel without changing anything. You take an air parcel at a constant pressure, at, at the same pressure, uh, that means uh, given the volume of the air parcel being held constant by not varying the pressure outside, what you can say is that the amount of water vapor is always not a constant thing. I mean, it will always vary with the temperature. So, if you go on increasing the temperature, the water draw, water, the air parcel seems to be having more tendency to accept more amount of water vapor into the air parcel. Now, what, what happens if there is a water vapor, then there is, there is also something called as the vapor pressure, the pressure that is built up by the moisture on the surface of water or on the surface of ice. Let us say if you have ice in an air parcel, in an in, in imaginary idea, uh, you have ice on the air parcel. So, there is, a, there is a pressure that is exerted by the water molecules that are inside the, in the gas 
that will exert pressure on the surface of this ice. So now this vapor pressure will not reach saturation at, until a point and when it reaches saturation what happens automatically it will lead to condensation. So the idea is the amount of water vapor that can be held in an air parcel depends directly on the temperature right. That also means that if you want to reach saturation you do not have to physically go on adding moisture so vapor pressure inside the air parcel becomes equal to the saturation vapor pressure. What you can simply do is you can you can decrease the temperature of the air parcel and say whatever the existing whatever the existing moisture content is the is the saturation moisture content in terms of mixing ratio right. So, this is this is an idea we have already discussed and uh, what the basic idea was for the formation of clouds is that how to decrease the temperature of air parcel. In the atmosphere gen naturally the temperature decreases as you go upwards. So, when you take this air parcel vertically upwards the temperature will decrease and uh, there will be a height which is called as the lifting condensation level at which automatically condensation will happen and it will lead to the formation of clouds. So, we, we should always remember that the lifting condensation level the which is called as the LCL is the height at which the bottom of the cloud will exist bottom of the cloud. So, this is the this is the point where the clouds will start to form. Now, there may be a possibility whether the cloud will develop vertically upwards above LCL sometimes it will and depending on the atmospheric stability sometimes the cloud will not develop vertically upwards rather the cloud will be like a thin sheet of uh, moisture or thin sheet of water droplets which is confined to a very narrow vertical growth right. Now, if you look at the picture on the left what you see you if you have a low temperature liquid in a in a container what the temperature inside this container is low that means when moist air becomes uh, comes in contact with the uh, with this container or in com comes in contact with this glass what happens immediately the temperature of this moist air is substantially reduced and as a result of this condensation happens and how do you see the condensation the condensation ha uh, the condensation you can see on the surface of this uh, container in term in the in the form of tiny droplets of water that means moist the air which is hot or which is which is warm already has some moisture content in it. It has some moisture content in it, but it is not ready to condense. It is not uh, ready to uh, make a phase transition from the gas phase to the uh, liquid phase. So, what you have to understand is let us imagine if you have an air parcel here. This is the moving air that, that is moving towards the uh, glass right. Now, if you have an air parcel here the warm moist air I mean the air is warm that means it has more ability to hold moisture that means there is already enough amount of moisture inside this air parcel. But since uh, this amount of moisture is not enough to saturate this air parcel at the given temperature, so it is not ready to condense. But when it brings when, when this air parcel becomes uh, close to this uh, container or when it makes uh, contact with the uh, glass suddenly this air parcel's temperature suddenly is dropped. So, whatever the moisture that was there now is existing as a super saturation uh, uh, super saturated uh, moist air. So, so suddenly this temperature decreases and uh, whatever the moisture that is there inside is thrown out by the means of condensation right. So, this is uh, this is a natural phenomena which occurs at higher altitudes and leads to the formation leads in the formation of clouds right. Now, so this is the basic review of the cloud formation mechanism. So, always remember uh, the height at which you see the uh, cloud bottom is to be is technically called as the lifting condensation level. This is the height at which the existing amount of moisture in the air parcel becomes equal to the saturation, uh, saturation vapor pressure or saturation uh, level of moisture inside the air parcel right. This is the basic idea that you should always remember about the formation of clouds right. Now, so what are clouds? How do you define clouds? Clouds are formed by tiny droplets of water or ice. So, depending on the height of the cloud, the cloud should can be made up of uh, droplets of ice. If it is very high altitudes, the temperatures will be very, very less. Then uh, the water vapor uh, may actually uh, 
uh, may actually freeze and form the crystal, tiny crystals of ice. And if the temp if the height is not so much, if it, if it is like 10 kilometers or something, generally the content, the clouds are generally made up of tiny droplets of water. And clouds form when water vapor cools and condenses. This is what this is what we have been talking about for so many uh, classes now, right? The temperature at which cloud condensation occurs is called as the dew point. So dew point is the temperature at which the relative humidity within the air parcel becomes equal to 100 percent. And most importantly, like in the last class while we were discussing the atmospheric stability, most importantly we should always remember for the formation of clouds, we always require what are called as the condensation nuclei. This condensation nuclei will act as platform to aid the condensation. So, these are the particles over which tiny droplets of water will be formed, right. Now, there are again different types of condensation nuclei. I mean, they, the few nuclei are, are hydrophobic in nature, that means they are water, they, they do not attract water and few nuclei are, are very well uh, easily dissolved in water. So, depending on the availability, a suitable mechanism will, will always take place. So, most importantly, for the formation of clouds, you always require what are called as the cloud condensation nuclei. Right. So, this so many times the, the aerosol particles are the cloud condensation nuclei, the cloud condensation nuclei. So, these are very, very, uh, very, very small particles typically in the sizes of let us say micrometers, right. But these particles do exist in the atmosphere as they are suspended and these particles will be held by the moisture to form the cloud, right. Now, then basically, so the type of ascent of a cloud, I mean, so we have discussed four different types of ascent of the cloud, right, four different types in which clouds, uh, so the four different mechanisms in which you can rise an air parcel from the surface to higher altitudes. Your objective of rising it is to decrease its temperature by which the parcel allows condensation, right. So, depending on the, on which mechanism has taken place to be, uh, to lift this air parcel to a particular altitude, it will, dip, it will decide what kind of cloud is the end product of this vertical ascent, good. Now, if the ascent is local, so let us say local ascent of warm and buoyant air parcels is conditionally unstable environment, which will result in the production of convective clouds. So, we have seen that unstable atmosphere is the one which makes an air parcel to move away from its original position. That means, the air parcel will never return back to its original position, right. So, what does it mean? It means that unstable atmosphere aids the formation of clouds if the mechanism of uplift is convection of small air parcels from the surface. So, typically the type of clouds that will result from convective ascent is varies in diameter from 0 0.1 to 10 kilometers. So, this is I mean these are the type of clouds that will form and the vertical velocity. So, you have to remember these numbers. So, typically convective clouds will form in the sizes of 0 0.1 to 10 kilometers and vertical velocity that means uh, the convection will give you a velocity of the nearly few meters per second. Now, in the earlier classes we also learnt that convection, uh, the mechanism of convection is more pronounced than the convergence. So, we have seen that convergence of air along the surface of the earth will lead to vertical ascent, but we have seen that the convergence is not so effective when you put convection in place. So, convergence will not be able to produce huge clouds whereas, convection will be able to produce a huge mass of clouds. And typically the convective clouds will have a typical uh, water content. So, this is the water content which will uh, which will again decide what is what could be the what could be the magnitude of uh, what could be the magnitude of uh, precipitation that you can expect from a particular cloud. That means, the type of ascent will decide the size of the cloud, the vertical growth of the cloud and what is the total amount of moisture that can be expected to be present in the cloud, which also means that this is the amount of precipitation that you can probably expect when the cloud, 
I mean, the cloud uh, goes through a particular type, particular process, and f results in the formation of rain, right? Precipitation, right? So now, so convective clouds uh, form in the diameters of 0 0.1 to 10 kilometers, and their vert vertical velocity is few meters per second when the ascent is happening, and water content is typically one gram of water per cubic meter for per meter cube. Let us say if the force of lifting of air, force of lifting of air is generally how do you force the air to move if it is, uh, so if the if the air is warm if it will move by itself in, the, in let us say in the process of convection. But if you are making the cold air to move up then it is called as a force of lifting. How do you make it? Let us say if you have a topography which supports it to be moved vertically upwards across a hill or something, then this will this type of ascent will not result in in very huge, uh, let us say in very huge water contents, but it will it will result in the formation of layer clouds. I mean the vertical ascent, the vertical growth of these clouds will not be much. Okay, and this this type of clouds occur anywhere from zero to tropopause. That means depending on the size of the vertical uh, ascent you, that you have been able to create, these clouds can be, uh, can be found anywhere from 0 kilometers to always, almost up to tropopause. These type of clouds are spread over hundreds of square kilometers. The vertical velocity is very, very small because we, we, all, we should always remember the convection is the strongest method or mechanism by which uh, clouds can form. right? And vertical velocity of the force of lifting is nearly few centimeters to 10 centimeters per second. So, if you put this number against this number against this number, let us say few meters per second, you will realize that the force of lifting is not so effective. Water content is always is also very very small. I mean, the water content is few tenths of a gram. So, in the in the in the convective lifting of the air parcel, the water content is one gram per cubic meter. So, if you compare the force lifting water content, it is very, very small, few tenths of. So, a, a layered cloud will contain few tenths of the amount of moisture that will be seen in a, in a convective cloud. So, that is the force lifting of air parcel as it, yeah, so that is what I, I was talking about. Force lifting is something when the air is cool, which is not ready to move up, but if it encounters a hill or something, it has to move across the hill as its wind velocity is in that particular direction. So, it comes across a hill. So, it has to move across this hill and it reaches high altitude. As it reaches high altitude, the temperature is, is anyway low. So, it has to condense and form the convective cloud at the top of this mountains. Right. So, this, these clouds are generally called as the orographic, orographic clouds. Okay. So, uh, you have to remember these names, this, uh, the number of uh, uh, parameters such as diameter, scale of these clouds and all. Right. So, cooling of air, so now the basic idea is cooling of air below the dew point coming in contact with a cold surface results in the formation of fog. So, fog or, so what do you mean? If the surface is very cold during the winters when the surface becomes very, very cold. Now, the air that comes in contact with this surface will be cooled. Right. So, when it is cooled automatically to a point, then if it reaches the dew point temperature, it will result in condensation. And since this condensation ha is happening at the surface, you, 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 see, you see fog, you see well, generally in the, in the winters that you see uh, fog that is, that is near the surface of the earth, which also hampers the visibility. So, the main reason is that it is the same process. I mean the same process in the sense here warm air that is originating from the earth is rising to higher altitudes and it is getting condensed at the at the let us say at 10 kilometers. There you see a volume of mass, I mean a huge volume of uh, cloud droplets you call you call it as cloud, right. But if the same process happens, so the basic mechanism you require for condensation is to decrease the temperature. If the if the air which is not saturated comes in contact with the surface which is very, very cold. So, automatically it will reach saturation and it will lead towards the condensation. When condensation happens, you see droplets, you see tiny droplets, very, very small droplets. right? So, in the winters, one more thing happens, in winters 
there is a huge availability of aerosol particles near the surface. It is always there due to the dust or soot or whatever it is. Now, if the air comes in contact with this cold surface, it will lead to the condensation and form fog. So, this fog is also kind of uh, is not is not different from the cloud, but you, the only difference is that you see fog on the surface, but you see cloud up in the sky, right. Now, so cloud names, I mean if you want to name a particular type of cloud, how do you name it? Let us say what, what are the parameters which you should think of and this name should reflect mainly the shape of the cloud, the color of the cloud and uh, what, what is the amount of moisture that it contains and the height. So, the any, any particular name that you put to a cloud, see at any given point of time you, if you see randomly in the sky you will see that you will realize that the, there are various different types of clouds. So, depending on the season you will see that these, these clouds are specific to a particular season or you will always you will also see that the clouds are specific to a particular altitude things like that right. Right. Now, if there is a different uh, difference in the shape of the clouds, so the whatever the name that you put for a particular type of cloud should be able to tell you what is the shape of that particular cloud, what is the height at which you can see this, see this cloud and what is the amount of moisture that can be derived when this cloud forms rain, right. So, these are the main requisite conditions for naming the cloud. So, names of specific types of clouds are generally obtained by combining the name of the cloud's shape with the name of the cloud's height. So, essential information that is given in a cloud's name is the shape of the cloud and height of the cloud, okay. So, cloud names. So, looking at history, let us say generally it was in 1802 that Luke Howard uh, invented the cloud naming system that we still use today. Howard used Latin names to describe the clouds. So, this, uh, this idea was Howard's idea. The first part of the cloud's name describes the height. So, you always remember the first part of the cloud always uh, gives you the idea of height and the second part of the cloud gives you the idea of shape. So, for a particular shape there is a particular name and for a particular height there is a particular name. So, you combine these two things. So, cloud names are to be derived by combining the shape of the cloud and the height at which you can see this particular type of cloud and the order is you put the, you put the height first and you put the shape next. So, the first part let us say you call the uh, prefix the first part is is the height. So, height comes first and the second part is the shape. So, you put these two things together then you will get a, a specific type or name of a cloud. So, the prefixes denoting the heights. So, what are the heights? I mean heights could be height generally varies from 0 to 10 kilometers, 0 to 15 kilometers. Sometimes it varies from 0 to 5 50 kilometers, right. So, how do you put the height? I mean what is the number, how which number correspond to which particular name? So, the prefixes denoting heights are zero. Zero means high clouds above 20,000 feet or 6,250 meters that means 6.25 meters, 6.25 kilometers. Alto means mid level clouds between 6,000 to 20,000 feet Right, right. So, and there is no prefix for the low cloud. So, you, so once we go ahead into the discussions, the cloud names will appear. Uh, some names will without any prefix. I mean, so some cloud names, which are low lying clouds. I mean, low heights. So, uh, you will not use the height information. But the mid level clouds are to be named as alto, and the high level clouds are to be named as zero. And this is the first part. So there is always a second part. So this is the alto is mid level clouds. This is high level clouds. And for the low level clouds, there is no such uh, prefix. You only use the suffix, right? So this is the main uh, main important thing, right? So the names denoting the shapes now. The names denoting the shape are cirrus. Cirrus means fibrous or let's say puffy kinds of clouds which are uh, uh, curly curly or fibrous type of clouds are called as cirrus. Stratus means layered. I mean you see layered uh, clouds you, you name them stratus. While cumulus means 
lumpy or piled. Okay. Now, here the most important thing is let us say if I can put cirrus, alto cirrus, I will put one suffix here. What does this mean? A curly fibrous type of cloud that is to be seen in the mid, mid altitudes which are approximately 6000 to 20,000 feet is generally called as alto cirrus. Okay. Generally, let us say if you see a layered cloud in the mid, lat mid altitudes, then you put it as alto stratus, right, like that. So, you can combine these two heights and these three shapes together to form different types of clouds. So, the third most important thing that you should add to the cloud name is the amount of precipitation that it can produce. If it can produce sufficient amount of pre precipitation, you should add nimbo or nimbus. So, nimbo or nimbus are to be added before this, nimbo cirrus or nimbo, nimbo stratus like this. So, nim nimbo comes before the shape. Okay. So, nimbo is added or nimbus is added. So, the depending on the depending on the way the word pronounces, you, you can add nimbo or nimbus is added to indicate the cloud whether it can produce precipitation or not. So, we, we will see, we will realize that some type of clouds will not reduce any precipitation, they would not precipitate. So, then there is no uh, uh, prefix of nimbo or nimbus to that particular type of cloud. So, what do we learn from this? So, this is the basic, I mean th this, the, this discussion is very important in the sense, uh, after a while the names are going to be uh, very confusing. So, th there will be a lot of names for different types of clouds, for different uh, heights, for different shapes, for different levels of precipitation. So, the basic thing that you should always remember is the cloud names are derived by combining the shape and the height, whereas the height comes the first which is the prefix and the shape comes as the suffix. So, height uh, can be classified into low lying clouds, mid altitude clouds and high altitude clouds. The low lying clouds do not have a prefix, but the mid, uh, mid lying clouds have a uh, prefix of alto and the high lying clouds have a prefix of zero. Right. Now, coming to the shape, if you see uh, curly fibrous clouds, you, you name them with a suffix of zero. If you see layered clouds, you name them with a suffix of stratus and while if you see uh, puffy clouds or lumpy uh, clouds, huge clouds, you, you name with a suffix of cumulus. Now, of these various different types of clouds, it is not required that all of them can produce sufficient amount of precipitation. Some of them may not be able to produce. So, just to differentiate, whatever the type of cloud that can produce precipitation is to be suffixed with, is to be prefixed with uh, nimbo or nimbus. Okay. Now, let us move ahead and try to understand uh, the basic uh, types of clouds. So, there are three basic types of clouds based on the shape cirrus, cumulus, stratus. Stratus is the layered, cumulus is, is the fluffy feathery kind of clouds, cirrus is, is the fibrous type of clouds. Right. So, today's classification has four main divisions. So, high clouds 6100 to 12200 meters, this depending on the height of occurrence actually. Intermediate clouds between 2 to 6.1 kilometers, so ending at uh, at the boundary of high clouds, low clouds near the ground to almost 2 kilometers and clouds with vertical development, the cumulonimbus clouds that we, we call uh, the most famous cloud. The clouds with vertical development nearly which will span all the altitudes which will, so generally the cumulonimbus cloud is, is considered the most magnificent cloud of all and the, this cloud starts to develop at 400 and or 500 meters and it will develop a single cloud spans across all the altitude ranges. It is not that it is confined to a particular level, it is not confined like that. Rather a single type of cloud which is confined, which is which is kind of what, which is kind of grown into all altitude regions. Okay. So, cloud classification is high, intermediate, low and what full development vertically. Right. So, the nomenclature high clouds have a prefix of zero, yes, intermediate clouds 
have a prefix of alto and low clouds uh, low clouds which are layered have a have a prefix of uh, strato and clouds with vertical development so generally this is the cloud type of cloud that you see most often when it is going when it is going to rain heavily is the cumulonimbus clouds okay so again the the yeah so one thing is so what we have to remember is uh, in terms of feet in terms of uh, in the units of feet uh, you have low clouds below 6500 feet and mid level clouds between 6500 to 23000 feet high clouds between 16500 to 45000 feet so the classification is as per the as per the naming system that has been developed in 1802 way back in 1802 okay now let us look at uh, uh, each type of cloud by the shape let's say for example the cumulus cloud is is a low altitude cloud so the typical base of these cloud this type of clouds will be at nearly uh, 7000 feet and this cloud can easily be identified by distinct or clearly defined edges usually the color of the cloud will be white and puffy and noticeable vertical development will be there so you will see that the cloud is vertically developed not a layered type of cloud and this type of cloud is mainly composed of tiny water droplets and in the colder climates if it is in the polar regions the same type of cloud will be made up of ice crystals and the main process that will result in the formation of these clouds is the thermal convection currents and where do you see these clouds you see them everywhere worldwide except antarctica because it is too cold out there so precipitation that can be expected out, out of this cloud will be none so you, this clouds will not precipitate so cumulus cloud is generally a white puffy type of cloud that you see at nearly 7000 feet and you don't expect any precipitation if you have this type of clouds in the sky on that particular day a simple forecasting whether uh, it is going to rain or not you can be able to say uh, looking at the shape of the cloud stratus clouds these are the lowest low lying clouds i mean this 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 these clouds are generally seen at very low altitudes they are layered structures so like the name suggests name itself suggests that it, these clouds are kind of layered structured clouds the base of these clouds is typically below 7000 feet they appear grave overcast they generally appear as grave overcast or can also be found sometimes as scattered so you see that there is no distinct edges to this cloud so the, the cloud appears as a complete overcast so you cannot find where the cloud is kind of beginning and what is the shape of this cloud right so they are kind of a layered development so they will have very very ill defined edges and you see these clouds worldwide mainly at the coastal regions i mean so near the mountains when yeah near the mountains that means forced lifting has been able to orographic clouds forced lifting generally results in the in the form of uh, layered clouds right and what can i mean the amount of precipitation that you can expect from this uh, this type of clouds is the, is a, is very small i mean you don't expect a lot of precipitation you generally expect a little drizzle out of this particular type of cloud so what have, what have we learned we have seen cumulus clouds which do contain water droplets but they don't precipitate now we are seeing the stratus clouds which are, which are which are made up of uh, 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 ice crystals or let's say the water droplets but you can expect a small amount of precipitation the height of these uh, stratus clouds is very very low right the cirrus clouds so cirrus clouds are there they are seen at very high altitudes like the name itself suggests now we are dealing only with the height and the shape right they are seen at high altitudes the cirrus clouds are seen at very high altitudes they look thin feather like uh, feather like shapes and this height this this type of clouds occur at the highest altitudes they generally occur between 16500 feet to 45000 feet so very high altitude and these crystals because they are at very high altitude are generally made up of the ice crystals okay and generally they generally occur in fair weather and point in the direction of the air movement so when the weather is very uh, clear you see these type of clouds 
and they always point in the direction in which the air is moving at that particular altitude. And you can see everywhere, you can see these type of clouds everywhere, uh, you, the, you, the, that means the occurrence is worldwide. The typical base itself is 18,000 feet. So you must compare this with the, with the numbers that we have seen in the last two different types of clouds, which whose bases generally exist at 6,000 or 5,000 feet. The cirrus clouds uh, are, are held very high altitudes, right? And they generally occur in fair weather and point in the direction of, uh, direction of wind and precipitation. So nothing that reaches the earth since these clouds are, very, are, are at very high altitude. No precipitation, even if it results from these, ty these type of clouds will never reach the earth. So basically what we have learned is that cumulus clouds are the, are the ones with distinct edges. Stratus clouds are the thin layered structure which, which appear like an overcast and the cirrus clouds which you see only when the sky is very clear, you see them at very high altitudes. They are generally made up of ice crystals and no precipitation by whatsoever will reach the earth. And most importantly, now uh, you, you see the cumulonimbus clouds. Now you see the cumulo is, is describing the shape uh, of a feather or puffy kind of a cloud and nimbus is giving you that giving you an idea that this, this type of cloud will have a lot of moisture content and this, this can precipitate high. So this cumulonimbus cloud is the tallest of all the clouds. That means you see them from a very low altitude to a very high altitude. This, the, the dark towering clouds produce, they can produce everything as such, rain, thunderstorms, lightning, strong winds, tornadoes. So they have the enough amount of force, they have the enough amount of moisture to produce all the climatic effects. They can span all the cloud layers. So we have, we have seen that they can span almost from uh, 500 meters to up till let's say 6,000 meters or 7,000 meters. So, so how do uh, these clouds form? This is the most important point that you should always remember the upward mobile cumulus cloud. So what is cumulus cloud? We have just seen what is cumulus cloud. Cumulus cloud is this one, let's say this, this cloud with a very clearly defined edges, a fluffy uh, moisture content. If it, this formation rises in height due to the unstable atmosphere, if the stability of the atmosphere helps this cloud to vertically develop, it will result in the formation of a cumulonimbus cloud. Where do you see them? You see them mainly in, tro in the tropics, but rare, mainly in the tropics because the convection is very strong in the tropics because of the high amount of, uh, large amount of heat that is received by the, near the equatorial, equatorial region, either sides of the equatorial region. So because of that convection being very strong, it will result in the formation of uh, this huge uh, pileup of clouds. Cumulonimbus clouds usually have large annual shape shaped tops because of the stronger winds at those higher levels of atmosphere. So you see that, you see this, this annual shape that you see here is because of the wind that is going in this direction. So here, so the, it, it diffuses the top of the cloud in, into the shape of an anvil, okay. And by uh, this cloud is considered to be the most magnificent uh, shape of, uh, shape that you can see. Uh, when, it is, when it is going to rain heavily, you generally see these type of clouds and these clouds uh, span the entire altitude range of the three or four defined ranges. It will span across all of them. And when you see these clouds, the, the expected precipitation is going to be high or it's going to be heavy. So simple uh, forecasting can be done. If you see this type of cloud in the sky, you can just say that it's going to rain heavily. That is one, uh, probably one advantage that you will, you will get after learning about the various different types of clouds, right. Now we will look into the secondary classification. So just to summarize, so the cumulo, the, based on the cl classification, the shapes, so it is, you have, we have seen what is, what is a cumulus cloud, how it forms uh, and uh, what is a layered cloud and what is a high uh, feather-like cloud and what will happen if a cumulus cloud grows vertically upwards and reaches very high altitude, you call it as the cumulonimbus cloud. So we will learn something about the secondary classification in the subsequent lecture.